I am here with Lynn Gray. She's out. She is one of our CDHI ambassadors out in Massachusetts, and she is the mom to Angel, to Angel Harper. And we often call her Princess Harper. And we would like you to introduce yourself. Let us know what life was like before CDH. Sure. Um, so my family at that time was um, myself, um, my son, Logan, um, my boyfriend, Harper's father, Tim Yuka, um, his two sons, also a Logan um, and Tyler. And we were blissfully unaware of what uh, CDH was at the time um, before, you know, 17 weeks into being, um, into carrying her. So it, it definitely was a, a blow when we got the news. Um, we had never heard of it before. And I think the stigma that a lot of people have when they first hear about, you know, CDH, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, you know, it's just a hernia, right? That's, right. that's a common um, misnomer there. And when we heard the news, um, as we were doing the routine ultrasound and heard hernia, we said, well, that seems like it should be pretty fixable, right? Um, and the doctor that was delivering the news was very, um, very straightforward in saying, this is, this is not a diagnosis you want to hear. This is something very serious. Um, we're going to need to do a lot more testing um, and evaluating, and we want to send you to Boston Children's for further evaluation and recommendations as you um, proceed, you know, throughout your pregnancy. So it was, it was a challenge, you know, we, we definitely didn't know at that time how truly serious it was until you get home and you start Googling, which is uh, a terrible thing to say. But it, it really was, it was disheartening to, to hear the, the statistics. Right. It was really, really tough to digest um, how truly, um, you know, life-threatening something as simple as what people think is just a hernia, it, it truly is not. Um, we learned about how uh, organs rising up into her chest was going to be very difficult um, for her viability. You know, there, there were so many things swirling around in our minds at that point in time. It was really like, it's just overwhelming, I think is, is the best word to describe it. Mm -hmm. Very overwhelming, very overwhelming. Did you have a, a plan for delivery? Did you make plans? Did you make a birth plan? Pre-CDH, it was going to be where my son was born in, in Northampton, Cooley Dickinson Hospital. And uh, we quickly had to pivot to uh, Boston Children's. Um, and that's about 90 miles from our home here in, in Western Massachusetts. Um, so there were a lot of, um, a lot of prenatal visits that had to occur, you know, towards the end of my pregnancy, I was going a couple of times a week for, mm -hmm. for several ultrasounds, stress tests, you name it. Um, and so we got familiar with the area pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, we, we met with the, the doctors that were going to deliver her. Um, they, they walked us through the, the uh, post-delivery care that would happen where at Brigham um, and Women's, that's where she was delivered. Obviously, a, a lot of people in that area know it's right next door to Boston Children's. So they, they took us into the emergency you know, delivery area where all of that would be transpiring. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and talked us through exactly what was going to be happening. We were very comforted knowing that there were, you know, it, it's sad, but helpful that, you know, other families are going through this as well. Um, so we made a lot of connections that way. And we were able to, um, we were able to get a lot of comfort from having a lot of those prenatal appointments um, and, and the doctors walking us through all of that. That's good. That's very good. Did you have any complications during your pregnancy? Anything that happened that caused concern for the doctors besides well, the CDH? My, my age was was a factor. Um, when I delivered her, I was I was just about thirty five. Um, so I was in the higher um, you know higher risk category just based on age alone. Um, and you know my first pregnancy with my son was um, I was 22 years old, so this was a very different pregnancy from 22 to 35. Uh, you know, 
the body just doesn't tolerate things as well. So it was um, leading up to just the, the normal discomforts. Um, there were a lot of concerns about too much fluid, um, mm -hmm. which I hear is very common uh, with CDH babies. Um, so they were monitoring that very, very often. Um, she was very tiny. Um, she came out six pounds, which was great, um, but they had size. been trending. Yeah, they had been trending her much smaller. So they had been doing measurements for her, um, you know, right along the way. Um, but the delivery was really, really, really tough. Um, you know, when she came out, there were a lot of complications. You know, she whisked out. Um, I got to see her face. Um, you know, right before they took her and, and intubated her, but um, I, you know, there were there were a lot of complications following that that made it where it's not possible for me or wasn't at that time or still isn't um, to have any more children at that point. Which again, at 35, that's okay. I I can live with that. <laughs> we delivered her. We you know had our girl, and mm -hmm. we were we were good with that. Did you have a planned induction to? with being in Boston? Yep. yep, it was planned induction. Um, and for that day that we went in, we actually went in June 11th to do the induction. And because Boston Children's emergent team that was going to be caring for her were tied up with another emergency at the time, they slowed their role and we ended mm -hmm. up staying the night um, and ended up delivering her the next um, morning, early afternoon instead. Um, but yeah, you know, it, 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 we took great comfort in that they were taking all of those precautions into play for the delivery was making sure that, you know, they had the right team members in place, that they had the right resources in place to, to be able to do the, the delivery the way that, you know, everybody felt comfortable with. Yes. Tell us a little bit about Harper's birthday. What happened that day? That day, um, they monitored her very closely. I was out of it for a while. There, the complications with my delivery, I stayed in, um, in the surgery room for a while. And um, her dad and my, my mother, his mother, were all present. I think his brother was there too. Um, they were getting updates from him. He was able to go with her to Boston Children's for, um, you know, getting her settled in and, and, and monitoring her. Um, they intubated her right away. Um, and as they were monitoring her over the course of the, um, the first 24 hours, um, they saw that her blood oxygen le levels were, were too low for, for comfort, um, but she was stable enough. They wanted to do the repair within that first 24 hours. So they ended up doing that. Um, so in the middle of the night, you know, the next day we, we hustled over me in a wheelchair and my mom and, and her dad went over and we, you know, watched, watched as our, our baby girl was, you know, being opened up at, you know, less than 24 hours old, having a repair surgery, you know, that's, that's just not normal. That's not, you know, it is to CDH families, but it's just not normal to Joe Schmo on the street mm -hmm. who, you know, can't fathom, you know, a surgery like this, right. um, but the, the, the doctors took great care in ensuring that we knew exactly what was happening. They checked in with us, you know, they, they had a, a little bit of a struggle, um, you know, getting to her because she was so tiny. Um, the repair was taking much longer than they were comfortable with, and they ended up calling in one of the specialists, again, in the middle of the night, I'll never forget, and um, he he was able to to take care of it in you know less than twenty minutes time, which was you know these, they're miracle workers. I, mm -hmm. I I can't say enough about the the care that we received and that she received. Um, after her repair surgery, um, within the, the next twenty four hours, she did have to go on ECMO. Um, they they were not comfortable with um, her levels. They continued to drop, and so they felt ECMO was going to be the best way to give her body a rest to you know recover from all of the the trauma of of having the repair surgery and 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 everything else that's going on in a tiny little body like that. Right, right. Tell us a little bit more about her time on ECMO. How long was she on ECMO? She was on for about 18 days. Um, and when I did my Google research, um, it, was, it was really tough because um, something uh, you know, I had read in an article or, or somewhere said that after 14 days, 
um, you know, ECMO is, isn't gonna do much more for you. And I've, I've heard stories since then where they're on ECMO for much longer than the, the 17 mm -hmm. or 18 days that she was. Um, but it just goes to show you that every single case is, is different. Every single baby is different. Nothing is cookie cutter for these kids. And um, you just have to let them tell you what, what they need. Um, she needed ECMO for a little longer. She needed it for the 17 or 18 days. And um, of course, you know, that 17 or 18 days, you're, you know, you're sitting on your hands. You're not wanting to cause her heart rate to go up. So you're, you know, you're watching your voice level. You're not wanting to touch her too much, but it, it's, it's difficult as a, a mom, you know, you know, you want to, to care for your child and you want to, you know, hold them and comfort them and, and, and take them through things. And it, it was a really, you know, the ECMO part, I have to say, was one of the more helpless feelings you have as a CDH parent is you literally put the life of your child in the hands of the, the caregivers and mm -hmm. they, you have to put your trust in your faith that, that they're going to do everything they can. And, and you know, they do, um, but it, it was a very challenging time. Um, I finally got to hold her uh, when she came off of ECMO. Um, a couple of weeks after that, they felt that she was strong enough to, to be extubated. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was pretty amazing, um, right. you know, to wait. I think we did the count. I think it was like 30 days on the nuts. So like it was like 30 days. That's when we had to wait to, for me to actually hold her for the very first time. And that, my God, I, you know, for six pounds, it felt like I had the weight of the world in my arms that day, you know, it just, yeah, I, you know, you know, those milestones, those are milestones that, you know, their first hiccup or their first, you know, giggle or their first smile, you know, CDH parents, we're looking forward to the first time we can hold them, the first time that we can give them a bath, the first time we can change their diaper. You know, right. those are, those are the milestones that are, you know, pre-CDH, I took for granted those things with my son. And for her, it was, um, you know, different milestones that, that meant different things. Right, right. So after you, she did get extubated. Did she ever have mm -hmm. to go back on the vent? She did. She did. Um, as her body continued to grow um, and every, you know, any CDH parent who's had to go through the drug weans knows how challenging those days can be. Um, the drug weaning, you know, her, her sweats and her heart rate would go up and there were a lot of challenges with that. So they felt like the, um, the oxygen, you know, upping that and intubating her again was going to help give her the break she needed. There had been talks um, a couple of months in about potentially re-entering the ECMO phase even um, as she deteriorated a little bit. She got some sepsis. Um, there were other infections that had been going on. And so um, that was something that they had entertained. And she finally came through um, all of those things and um, was extubated for a second time um, after about three months. Um, so that three month mark, you know, she, she was with us for 126 days. So um, just about four months. Um, that three month mark, I feel like those couple of weeks after were the best times that we had with her. She was smiling, um, she was growing, she was, you know, she was a real baby, you know, mm -hmm. like that she wasn't as, she was fragile, obviously she's in ICU, but you, you know, we got to do more things for her and with her, we got to bathe her more and do give her her cares um, without um, concern that, you know, we needed somebody to, to do them with us. And, you know, a, a, or a nurse or her primary care to, to take care of those things. So that, you know, that new normal that we were in, it was, it was, it was really, it was, it was good. It was good for a couple of weeks. Uh, but then um, she started to deteriorate again. Um, and we had several meetings with her primary care team, um, her surgeons, her primary care nurses, and um, discuss different ways to approach um, the, the challenges she was seeing, um, which ultimately were 
as her body was growing, her heart and her lungs were not growing at the pace that was keeping up with her, with her growth. And she was just getting so tired. She just, she just couldn't hang on anymore. You know, she, it was a really, really awful time to have to make the choices that you have to make as a, a parent in that case. You know, you want, you want to fix it, you know, and some things you just can't fix. And this was, this was one of them. And she, she gave us four months of, of trying her hardest and her best. Um, but it just, her body got very tired. So we had to um, make some really tough calls, really tough decisions. Um, met with her primary care surgeon who had said, you know, you need to think about when it's, it's gonna be time um, to take her off of the machines because things are not improving, they're deteriorating. She had tachycardia um, constantly, you know, and they had to pull her out of that. And it was just, you know, it was a CDH uh, tantrum. Like, I just don't want to do this anymore. That was, you know, kind of how I it felt it was. Like, I'm just hired, mom, you know? Mm -hmm. So we, I had a little conversation with her um, one night just before she passed and, and let her know she can tell me when it's, it's time to go and I will, I will accept that. I'm so sorry. She's, you see the pictures of her and, you know, we've seen the pictures of her smiling and my heart goes out to you. Thank you. I, you know, it, there's, there's something to be said for her blessing us for the time that she did. She, you know, she gave us, she gave us everything. She gave us the best and she tried hard and we were rooting for her. We were her biggest fans. You know, you mentioned we called her Princess Harper. We had set up a, a social media, you know, blog, if you will, where we were keeping her royal court um, apprised of her progress daily. Um, so, you know, it would be a Princess Harper update day 68. You know, today she's doing good or you know, today is not a good day. And that royal court um, included so many people that had no idea what CDH was, um, but also families that um, were in the hospital with us um, at Boston Children's that we were connected to through CDH International um, and the Cherubs. And so that network, um, you know, that the other CDH parents know what you're going through, um, but those families and, and the family and friends that followed her story that we were sharing, um, you know, along the way, pre-delivery pre and post-delivery, I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to raise awareness about something like this to families that wouldn't have otherwise been exposed to, to this story. Um, so it's really important for me even today, you know, it's been, my goodness, um, in, in a few weeks, it would be seven years since she was born. Um, seven years later, I'm still connected to Cherub's families, um, still chat with them. Um, I follow, especially the ones that are thriving, um, you know, seven years later, where we shared space in, in the hospital and, and cried together and laughed together and got coffee when things were getting really tough, um, those families were still connected to. Um, and I'll forever be grateful to CDH International for connecting us because, you know, even today, it, she can't be with us here. Um, but sharing her story, continuing to share her stories is really important to me to raise awareness about, about this. Uh, but also, you know, making those connections with other families that have gone through it and seeing that there, there are great stories out there of, of kids that have survived and, and are doing well into adulthood. And, you know, those, those really make my heart feel good too. And, and a lot of those families still send me pictures of oh. pink, you know, pink skies or rainbows or a, a beautiful butterfly 
um, because Harper lives in their hearts too. Mm -hmm. So that to me is, is the world. That, that means, you know, she's not with me physically here, but she's living on in the hearts of all of those families. And she's living on and, you know, and sharing those little signs with everyone that, you know, she's watching over all of the CDH babies. I know she is. I know she is. She's proud of her mom. Lynn, you've given back so much through now working as a CDHI ambassador for Massachusetts, and you have raised, you have done several different fundraisers over the year and raised money in her memory, and we greatly appreciate you so much. It's, it's my honor to, to help because every little bit that, you know, that, that goes to raising more awareness, you know, the more awareness that's out there, the more people are going to be willing to, you know, to open their pocketbooks and help with, um, you know, fundraising. It's, it's important that there is a, a face and a name to it. And I, I, I said that before she was even born, you know, you don't, you, you didn't know anybody with CDH before today, but now you do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important because it, it's still, it's still out there. It's still happening. And there, you know, we were no closer to, to figuring out the whys or the hows, but people still, you know, have to, to deal with this. And whether it's close to home or far from home, you know, babies are, are struggling with this. And it's, it's, it's important to me that, you know, if we can do anything to, to help, you know, we're, we're here to do it. It's, if it's fundraising, if it's wearing pink, you know, for, for Harper, if it's mm -hmm. wearing the bracelet, which I don't take off, oh. if it's, you know, whatever we can do, we, we really want to help because, you know, her story is, is important um, to me and her family, but it's important to, you know, to strangers and family and friends to, to know there's someone that they know that has sure been affected by this. Sure it is. Here it is. If you have any other advice for a CDH family, what would that be? I think that, um, you know, as much as it's, it's tempting to Google the statistics and it's tempting to, um, you know, scare yourself like, you know, the WebMD stuff. I think that it's really important um, that the most important meeting that we had was when we sat down with the Boston Children's Surgeons um, to, you know, before she was born to discuss with us exactly what would happen, exactly what her case was. Because again, I go back to the, every case is, is different. You know, what you read about um, online is, is not necessarily gonna be the case that's applicable for your particular CDH baby. Um, every child is different. I was on the floor with about six families. Um, five of those families got to take their baby home. Um, I was the six that didn't. And I had read that the CDH girls were stronger and, you know, more resilient. And all of those babies were boys that went home. It was like, you know, so don't fool yourself into thinking that the, the things that you read online are, are necessarily true because it's very easy to get wrapped up in that and give yourself, you know, false, false sense of, of comfort or in false sense of, of panic. Um, understanding the true diagnosis of your particular situation is really important. And second, is being an advocate for your for your child. You know, I, I can't say enough how wonderful um, the nurses were at Boston Children's that helped our family walk, you know, walking us through, you know, when rounds are coming around, pay attention to what the doctors are saying about the, the next steps for care. If you don't feel comfortable with those steps, you need to speak up because just because they say that it's, it's what should be done isn't necessarily how you feel and, and your mother's instinct that, that it's the right step to take today. Maybe you want to wait a couple of days before you do the wean or, you know, whatever it may be, but being an advocate and speaking up, um, if you feel like there is something that you're not ready for, or your baby is not ready for, definitely you, you're the voice, you know, if you would speak up, if it was you, um, you should do that for your child as well. Mm -hmm. That's very good advice. Thank you. Lynn, it's been a great pleasure speaking to you, listening to Princess Harper's story and 
raising awareness today. And I just want to thank you very much. Anytime, Tracy. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Anytime you need anything, just let us know. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you.